All right, I'm going to hit the broadcast button right now. So just give it about 30 seconds. 30, and you're, you started Facebook already? Yep. Cool. All right, here we go. One, two, three. Hello, uh, my name is David Zyla and welcome to episode five of Feel Good Beauty. To watch other episodes of Feel Good Beauty, check out my YouTube channel. So what is Feel Good Beauty? Um, so I've spent my year, my career rather, uh, helping women feel like the best versions of themselves. And when it comes to feeling beautiful, what I've discovered is that it's not about chasing trends, transforming yourself into an ideal, or even shifting one inch out of your comfort zone. It's all about identifying and magnifying the unique individual and beautiful woman that you are. So in today's episode, which I'm very excited about, uh, I'm going to share some tips with you on discovering and how to wear your very own personal neutrals. Uh, we're going to uh, talk about uh, tackling menopause naturally with best-selling author and integrative dietitian Esther Blum. We're going to reveal the inspirational power of music with award-winning harpist Brandy Younger and creating your very own home spa with Make It Up, The Essential Guide to DIY Makeup and Skincare author, Marie Rayma. So we're going to meet all three of those people very shortly. But first, let's talk about neutrals. So if we could go to the first slide. So neutrals in a wardrobe are exactly that. They're those pieces that are very useful um, that we use over and over again. And one, one important thing to think about uh, when we're discussing neutrals is that neutrals give a backdrop to color. So if you're gonna wear, you know, in a, in a previous episode, uh, we talked about finding your version of red, or I call it your romantic color. So if you're gonna wear your romantic color, you know, you might not be wearing it in your earrings, your necklace, your dress, your shoes, and your bag. It's a bit much, um, but a neutral in the shoe, maybe the shoe and the bag can really help offset that color. So neutrals are extraordinarily helpful. Um, I also refer to neutrals as bases. Um, and again, they're base colors, kind of like a base note in a piece of music. Um, and we're gonna hear all about music today. So neutrals are extraordinarily important in building blocks um, of a wardrobe. And today we're gonna talk about finding your versions of black, brown, and khaki. If we could go to the next slide. So black, brown, and khaki. So, so this is how I want you to look at it. When is the little black dress not black? Uh, so we all have a personal color palette and we all look great in different colors. And black, a really formal neutral may not suit you, but there is a version of black that will suit you. Just like there is a version of brown that will suit you and a version of khaki. And these three neutrals are the most formal, which would be your version of black, also known as your first base. Your second base is your version of brown, which is like an everyday neutral. And then your third base is um, your version of khaki. And this would be like the informal, you know, weekend neutral to use. So um, let's go to the next slide. So let's first talk about discovering your first base or your version of black. And this color um, literally comes from your eyes. So if you were to 
um, use an app to take a photo of your eye, like a color picker kind of app and blow it up, um, you're gonna look for the ring around your iris. And this is your version of black. Uh, if we could go to the next slide. Um, and there is a huge number of possibilities. Um, it could be a gray, it could be a black itself or an off black. Uh, it could be a purple, it could be a blue, it could be a green. It's gonna be a darker tone just because, you know, a, a, a mid to darker tone, um, just because that, it, you know, if you look at rings of eyes, you'll see that that is a darker part of, of the colors in our body. Um, also, um, what's really interesting about this color is that you could look at different items around your house, uh, hold it up to, to your eye. Uh, you can get paint swatches to do this. But also, if you look in your makeup drawer, this is a wonderful place to help figure this out because many, many times, I will find that clients have an eyeliner in this exact color. Um, and so this is another way to find it, to find out what that is. So again, a world of possibilities. And what I'm showing you here, this is just a very small sampling. So let's go to the next slide. So here's an example of how to find your first base. And so if you look at the eye here, you'll see that the ring around the iris is an olive color. Um, an important thing to understand and to keep in mind is that whenever you're creating your own palette of colors, that every single color that you wear should make everything glow. Um, you should never say, well, this color really looks good, you know, against the ring around my eye and, you know, it pales out my skin a little bit. It should never, ever do that. Everything should be harmonious. I really believe that every individual is the subject of a great portrait painting. And if you think about the subject of a great portrait painting, uh, you're drawn into them. Everything about them is sort of coming forward. And so that's a really important thing to always remember. Um, so her um, first base or her formal neutral or version of black would be olive. And let's go to the next slide. And here's another example. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that um, even though this woman has very um, high contrast coloring, uh, the ring around her eye is this petrol color. Um, it's not black, um, even though you'd, you'd say, oh, well, you know, but her eye has light and dark and it's really dramatic. And, and we think of black as a dramatic color. Well, I also want you to think as, of petrol as a dramatic color. Um, and in fact, you know, all first bases can be dramatic on the wearer. So here is her first base or version of black, which is petrol. So how do we use these colors? So let's take a look. Let's go to the next slide. So the first base in your wardrobe. So if you think about this color as your formal neutral, um, what I would say is a, a business suit is fantastic in this color. Um, I also love it in a very good quality uh, dress coat. Um, if you live in a place where you need coats, um, it's really helpful in a coat. Um, it's also good to use as the little black dress, like I've done here with this uh, grape colored one. Um, it can be a go-to um, dress to wear anywhere as well. Um, it also can be uh, very helpful in a formal handbag and form, you know, more formal shoes. So I'm showing you both a boot here and a purse um, on this page. So again, it's the dressier things in the wardrobe. And I'm gonna just give you one cautionary tale. And that is, if you purchase things that are very informal in this color, you're not going to wear them. So think about it this way, how often have you worn black shorts to the beach in the middle of the summer? 
I don't think you've done that very often. And you'll say, well, it just doesn't feel right. Well, the reason it doesn't feel right is because black is a really formal color and shorts are a very informal piece of clothing. Um, and so generally speaking, um, don't take a formal color and put it into an informal uh, piece of clothing to wear. So let's go to the next slide. So let's talk now about discovering your second and third bases. So again, the second base in your wardrobe is your version of brown. This is a really helpful, very useful everyday basic to wear. Um, and then the third base is the weekend neutral to wear. And they both come from the colors in your hair. Let's go to the next slide. So you're going to look at the darkest color in your hair. And, you know, it's funny. Recently, I was working with a client who told me, how her hair colorist had to adjust something in the formula. She was having highlights done because she quote unquote, didn't want green hair. And I found it very interesting because I've worked with so many people that have green in their hair. Um, you know, every color that you see on this board and many, many more could exist in your hair. Um, and so don't discount any, and again, using items around the house. Uh, if you have scarves, t-shirts, et cetera, hold it up to your hair, take a photo of your hair, blow it up, um, use paint swatches. Um, there are several apps out there to help you determine what this color is. And I ask that, that you really dig deep on this, um, you know, to just say, you know, my hair's brown, you know, it's like, well, which shade of brown? Is it caramel? Is it auburn? Um, but maybe, you know, if you, if you say, well, my hair is auburn, maybe, maybe it's actually more of a deep rust, you know, work, you know, work to find choices here, um, that really illuminate, um, and this will probably take you several steps. And so again, this is the second base. This is the informal neutral on your palette. So let's go to the next slide. So here we have, we're looking at the darkest color in the hair. And the darkest color here would be this, like I'd call it like a blue violet ink color. So it's very deep. It's got just a hint of purple with it. And, um, and if you want to, as an experiment, look at this same slide with a swatch that doesn't have the purple in it, that's just the blue. And you'll see that it, it, it kind of doesn't quite fit in the same way. Um, adding this touch of violet really connects with that darkest color in the hair and really illuminates what's there already. Let's go to the next slide. And here we have an aubergine tone. Um, and this is the darkest color that's in the hair here. Um, and again, both of these colors are the person's version of brown or a really good everyday neutral. Um, it's, uh, let's go to the next slide. And it's really helpful for shoes and boots. Um, it's great for a belt. Um, I love it in uh, an everyday jacket or coat. It's also really helpful in a basic slack or skirt as well. Um, so that's the second base. Let's go to the third base. So your third base comes from the lightest color in your hair. And again, it can be a war, it can be all of these different colors. One thing I will mention is that um, you definitely, um, this particular color, um, it's very important to notice what is actually the lightest color in your hair. Sometimes people will say, oh, I have highlights that are blonde, let's say. And, but if you really look carefully at the hair, maybe there's actually a really, really pale um, chestnutty tone in there as well. That's actually lighter than that blonde highlight. Um, so you definitely want to go for the lightest color in the hair. Um, 
So anyway, so here's a whole group of possibilities. Um, I also will mention that if one has quote unquote gone gray, um, again, that's not necessarily, uh, let's say you're, you're starting to go gray, if you will, or oyster or platinum or, or any one of the colors that you could go. Again, remember, take a look if that is the lightest color in the hair or not. It may not be. It's the newest and you're not used to it, um, but it may not be the lightest. So take a, a really careful look there. Let's go to the next slide. So here I'm showing you um, the lightest tone uh, in this hair would be what I call lilac gray. So you see that it's a gray that's got just a little bit of purple in it. Um, and you'll see that this is the lightest color that we see in the hair here. Um, and again, this is the casual neutral. And we're gonna talk how to use it, talk about how to use it in just a moment. Let's go to the next slide. And here we have a frosted sage color. Um, and so this is this hair, um, you'll notice that the highlight that's coming out, um, it's not white, it's not, it's not a tan color. Um, it really has this little bit of green to it. Um, and it's like a, you know, a green gray or a sage color. Um, so this would be her uh, third base. So let's talk about how to use these colors in your wardrobe and go to the next slide. So the third base in the wardrobe, as I said earlier, this is the casual neutral. So this is perfect for uh, a sun hat. So if you're looking for what kind of straw hat to buy in the summer, this is the color to buy it in. Um, it's also really useful for informal shoes, an espadrille, a sandal, uh, a sneaker, et cetera. Um, really great for an everyday trench coat. Um, also very helpful in something like a windbreaker or a pair of shorts, um, sort of anything you'd wear on the beach or like on vacation, you know, vacation mode. Um, it's really, really helpful for that. Um, and again, I'm gonna say one other, uh, give you one other cautionary tale here. Just like we spoke earlier, um, about the first base or your version of black, buying that in informal clothes, the exact same thing holds true with the third base in the opposite direction. So buying, uh, you know, a, your version of like a go-to little black dress to wear to a cocktail party in this color is probably not going to work. Um, you probably won't wear it. You'll wear it in the summertime, uh, but you'll find that it doesn't quite have the formality and you'll wear it in a less formal situation. So again, if you're looking for a cocktail dress, I probably wouldn't do it in the third base, um, but a linen you know, maxi dress or something like that, fantastic. So, um, so let's just go back and look once more at the three bases. So if we could go to the next slide. So again, a recap is first base is your version of black. It's the formal neutral. So I'm showing you this beautiful uh, indigo blue dress here. Um, it can be used in a formal dress, cocktail dress, a, uh, a, uh, a suit. Um, it also is good for your very formal accessories like a purse or shoes. Um, the second base, which I'm showing you in the middle, um, can be fantastic in a casual jacket like this leather one. Um, it could also really, really useful for accessories and shoes in a wardrobe. Uh, it also can be a go-to everyday coat as well. Um, and then the third base, um, which is where I'm showing you the shorts and the, and the sandal, this is the informal neutral. So again, really informal clothing, shorts, sandals, um, espadrilles, things like that. So if you look at this slide, um, on your left-hand side, you'll see the most formal color, and to the right, you'll see the least formal. So that is how you use your bases and discover them. And here is how to follow me and find out more. Uh, the tips that I gave you today are from my book, Color Your Style, and you can find more detail uh, about 
finding them there. So I promised you some extraordinary guests today and I am going to deliver. And so our first guest is Esther Blum. So Esther Blum is an integrative dietitian and high performance coach. She's helped thousands of women permanently lose weight, eliminate the need for medication, lose stubborn belly fat and reverse chronic illness. Uh, her, she is the best-selling author of Cave Women Don't Get Fat, Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous, Secrets of Gorgeous, and the Eat, Drink, and Be Gorgeous Project. She currently maintains a busy virtual practice where she provides 360 degrees of healing with physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual support. Widely respected as an industry expert, Esther was voted best nutritionist by Manhattan Magazine. She has appeared on Dr. Oz, The Today Show, A Healthy You with Carol Alt, The Isaac Show, ABC TV, Fox 5's Good Day New York, and Fox News Live. She is an in-demand authority, frequently quoted in E! Online, In Touch, Time Magazine, The New York Post, The Los Angeles Times, In Style, Bizarre, Self, fitness and Marie Claire. Without further ado, welcome Esther Blum. Hey, David, I'm so oh. excited to be here again. Thank you for having me back. Oh, thank you for joining us. And, you know, so for my first question to you is, I, I know our topic today is talking about going through menopause naturally. What is going through menopause naturally? <laughs> going through menopause is taking naturally is taking into account the whole person it is diet it is lifestyle and it is mindset so i'm going to touch on one needle moving change that you can incorporate into your life um, from each of those categories and even if you start by one doing one thing at a time, you will still move the needle. But I highly recommend everyone take notes on this call. I, I see uh, a couple clients of mine are here. So it's nice to see you both here. And um, make sure you take notes because you're gonna wanna uh, to look back on this. And these are things that your doctor will not tell you. And these are also gonna bust up any myths or confusion that you have from reading so many books that you now have analysis paralysis. So I'm just gonna pare down you know, a, a common sense with absolutely scientific knowledge and get everyone towards their goal of being healthy and strong and having strong bones throughout the years. Excellent. So what is, what, what would you say in, in, with all of the people that you've worked with, what is the common thing that is not done or ignored in this process? <laughs> um, well, I'd have to say this is tip number two, but I would have to say eating optimal protein, David. And what most people don't understand is that at best they're reading adequate protein. And um, I have poured through hundreds and hundreds of studies. If you read my book, Cave Women Don't Get Fat, Fat in the back, there are hundreds of studies I've read through. And I that was written a few years ago. So I continue to read and the recommendations for protein drastically need to be revamped. You know, there, um, if you look through even a clinical nutrition journal or sports medicine journal research studies, they will show that the average adult needs about 60 grams of protein a day. That is what I put my patients on in the hospital when they had kidney failure and were awaiting dialysis. So it's not optimal. We actually do need more protein as we age, not less. And that is because um, we lose one half to one pound of muscle tissue every year over the age of 40. Every year, we're not doing any kind of resistance training. We're not doing strength training. Um, we lose muscle mass. And if you're lifting weights and not eating protein, you can actually compound the problem. So you wanna make sure that you are eating enough protein and how much is enough. So this is where you can bust out your calculator. You can do your math. Um, I always start with the number 150 pounds because some people are below, some people are around that range and some people are above. But let's say you're 150 pounds, man or woman, that means you need to eat one gram per pound of body weight. Your target is 150 grams. 
That is about 21 ounces of protein or about five ounces of protein four times a day. That's a lot for a lot of people, including me. I'm gonna be honest and say some days I just don't always feel like eating that much protein or I'm full before I can eat that much protein, but I really try every day. Um, the minimum you amount you should start with is 100 grams of protein a day. Um, but this is to not only, you know, adequate protein will at best hopefully maintain your muscle mass, but optimal protein will build it. And why do you even need muscle mass? Because as we age, right, we see changes in bone density. We have a propensity to falls um, and lose our balance as we age. And the good news is, is that there are studies, David, of people in their 90s who are building muscle if they're doing consistent strength training. So like, I never, you know, I, I never take as an excuse. I'm too old. It's too late. It's never too late. Never, never, never. So, so this, this protein, um, which we are supposed to consume quite a bit of, um, how do you suggest we get that? So um, animal protein is much more efficient form of ingesting protein because it contains all the essential amino acids that your body can't make. We rely on an outside source for those. That's what it means to be essential. So eggs are one of the most bioavailable proteins. They convert quickly and easily to muscle, but um, chicken, fish, turkey, venison, lamb, beef, um, any wild game, if you like boar, if you like kangaroo or rabbit or, you know, any other wild game is great. But basically, um, if it grazes on grass or lays eggs, you know, that's a wonderful source of protein. But also I love to make my own bone broth because that's a great with real bones or chicken feet. And that's another great source of essential aminos. Wonderful. Um, and are, is there any particular exercise that you recommend as one is going through menopause? Yes. I recommend that you really invest in um, some, and now that everyone's doing home gyms, right? And really you need about a hundred square feet of space max and maybe a mirror and some weights. And you don't need a lot of space at all. Um, but I do recommend um, lifting heavy and heavy for you, you know, your starting weight might be five pounds, might be two pounds, right? But your goal is to build up to 10 pounds 12 pounds, 20 pounds. And often with us, we the mind quits long before the body does. Um, so obviously if you have aches and pains or tears in your shoulders or knee issues, obviously check with your doctor or a physical therapist or someone who's gonna, or hire a professional strength coach, someone who's going to really guide you specifically on what you should and shouldn't be doing. But for the average healthy person who doesn't have any joint or back issues, um, I like a mix of whole body, upper and lower body. So, and YouTube is great for this. Like if you're just starting out, you can even Google at home workout using my body weight. Cause if you're 150 pounds and you're squatting, you're squatting 150 pounds. <laughs> so, uh, so you're still starting there, but slowly add things in. You can do bicep curls. You can do tricep kickbacks. You can do chest presses. You can hold two kettlebells and do lunges or just walk up and down the stairs of your home carrying weights, right? That alone is huge. Um, you can um, do all sorts of backward lunges and forward lunges. You can even use those furniture sliders that you put under your furniture to move them and you put them under your feet. And that's how I do in my we have a little loft area where we keep our weights and I, it's carpeted. So I use the sliders on the carpet, but you can use them on the floor too. Um, two to three times a week, a week for 30 minutes, 60 minutes is more than enough. Even, you know, 30 minutes, I like to just get it done and get it over with and sweat, 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 and then go for a nice long walk after. And that alone will absolutely change your body composition. You will build muscle, you will burn fat, 
and you will burn more calories at rest. I love how with everything, with all of the expert advice you give, um, you make it so easy for us to understand. Um, and, you know, you make it, you kind of demystify things for us and, and take away that, that, uh, the hurdle that might be in the way. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I want to mention that if people have questions for Esther, they can type them in uh, to the chat area. Um, I'm wondering, are there, does, does exercise and diet change from going through menopause to being post-menopause? Such a brilliant question. Thank you. Um, yes, because post-menopause, you are absolutely more insulin resistant, which means your body's going to have a harder time breaking down sugars and an easier time storing them as fat. And so, um, because often a, a few things happen. One is, you know, um, a woman's testosterone and her progesterone, there are many forms, there's seven forms of each, right? So all the testosterones, all the progesterones and all the estrogens can drop. And typically they cycle up and down when a woman is having regular monthly cycles. So once they drop, it's much harder for the body to burn fat efficiently and to have the support and the metabolic balance to, or hormonal balance to really burn fat. So by eating enough protein, protein will stabilize your blood sugar for up to six hours after you eat it. Whereas carbohydrates raise your blood sugar and lower it within two hours. So if you're getting enough protein, you're going to control your appetite as well, because protein's the only nutrient that shuts off hunger in the brain. And you will keep your blood sugar stable. And both of those uh, criteria make it very easy for the body to burn fat. Then um, once you add in strength training and you're building muscle, you can actually raise your testosterone. I've seen the blood work of my menopausal clients. I test blood and urine, but I've seen blood work testosterone go up just from doing upper body weights but also um, high intensity interval training can raise your testosterone. So let's say you have a spin bike um, and I can show you guys like in my, this is in my office. I just have a little spin bike. It's called a sunny. I got it for like 300 bucks on Amazon. So um, doing intervals on a spin bike can also raise your growth hormone, which helps you build muscle lowers insulin and helps you sleep. So all of those are really, really important. So if you don't, if the science is like woo over your head as it is most of mine, <laughs> mine as well, just remember, eat enough protein, lift your weights, do some interval training, and that alone will very much help you in the fat loss department. And I see we have a couple of questions too. I was going to say, and uh, do you want to go ahead and take uh, yeah. the first one about yes. uh, collagen protein? Yes. And hi, Julie. Hi. Uh, what do you think of the collagen protein that you can add to juice or water? This is, this is your beautification protocol, right? It's great for hair, skin, and nails, but it doesn't have all the essential amino acids. So Take that for just younger looking skin and beautiful hair, skin and nails. But then um, I would eat real sources of protein. Now, why aren't I saying go and get protein powder and drink protein shakes? I like people to eat real food because when you drink a protein shake, you are liquefying food and it passes through your digestive system and raises your blood sugar and your insulin very quickly. So it's not optimal when you're trying to lower your insulin and balance your blood sugar, if you have fruit in that, which most people do. The next question, do androgens or hormones affect weight loss? Absolutely, of course. If your hormones are low, um, this is why I test my clients. I test every single client that comes into my practice, looking at their androgens, looking at their DHEA, their estrogens, testosterones, progesterones. I look at their melatonin. I look at their cortisol, their morning and metabolize. So I do a lot of specific testing in my practice. 
um, to see where the androgens are. Because if you have very high circulating estrogen, for example, it's very hard to lose weight. Makes it fat, it makes you fat loss resistant. Um, oh, Julie, this is a very nice testimonial. Esther is amazing and changing my life. I've lost 29 pounds in two months. Set up a call with her, at least buy one or all of her books. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Um, Donna, what's your opinion of bioidentical hormones as a bridge and transition to postmenopause? I can't say enough about it. Um, it's, it's wonderful. But before you do it, test. Test your levels so you know where you're at. My doctor will always just say to me, just take the pill. I'm like, but you don't know my estrogen levels. Why would you say that? So I test my own hormones and take, you know, the right combination that works for me and where my levels are at now. So could you remind us how to calculate how much protein we need? One gram per pound of body weight. So let's say you have 150 grams because you're 150 pounds, divide that number by seven, and that will give you the amount of ounces that you need. There's seven grams of protein in one ounce, so 150 grams is 21 ounces of protein. Okay, unfortunately, all of these exercises and high intensity interval training are not good for me as I have fibromyalgia. Okay, I'm really glad you brought this up, Anja, because um, another great exercise for menopause and menopausal symptoms. And for you, if you have fibromyalgia is yoga and you can do gentle yoga. You can do, there's a YouTube channel called yoga for Adrian that really has all levels. So yoga would be perfect for you. Trying to build muscle, but I'm struggling to keep up with YouTube videos and struggling with remember directions. Are there training programs that make it easier? Um, yes, Julia, um, Message me or I'll message you after. Yes, there are. Um, I can refer you to a strength coach that I uh, refer a lot of my clients to who works virtually with people and customizes. I eat keto. Eating too much kicks me out of keto because it triggers insulin. That's absolutely right. You can trigger yourself out of keto even if you have too much protein. So you do have to be careful. Please clarify, is it 20 ounces per day or per meal per day? 20 ounces per meal, my goodness. You'd be uh, like <laughs> Andre the Giant. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm sure that we love that, that, uh, you know, that you said it. <laughs> two special offers. Okay, one is if you go to my website, estherblum.com. Whoops, sorry, a typo, estherblum.com. You can download my book, How to Lose three, three, three Simple Tricks to Lose Three Pounds this week. And then if you are serious about making health changes for yourself, you can book a 30-minute strategy session with me if there are specific health issues you want to work on and you want a customized plan, call, um, book your call with me at estherblum.com forward slash call. And you can follow me on social. My links are on my website and uh, my books are there. So thank you for your time today. I don't want to take up too much time. Esther, last question though. If our audience said, you know, I really am serious about um, building my strength, having a, a healthy transition, you know, through menopause, what's the one thing that they could start doing right now today uh, and they're uh, assuming weights are not part of the equation just today you just yet what what would be your wish what would be the first thing that you would say okay you can do this right now yeah go eat a steak at your next meal <laughs> well that was easy <laughs> <laughs> go eat a steak right? Sleep really well because your blood sugar is balanced and you wake up in the morning, have a nice vegetable omelet and go lift some weights, go for a nice walk, let your food digest. And then for half an hour, just go hit the weights or do some gentle yoga if that suits you better. And you will balance your hormones. You'll control that belly fat and you will have a lean metabolism. You, it, weight gain is not inevitable in menopause. It's really controllable. Wonderful. Well, Esther, thank you so much for all of your fantastic tips. 
And uh, we really appreciate you being with us today. Thank you so much. I'm so grateful. Thank you, David. Take care. So now I have for you um, a really incredible guest. Um, her name is Brandy Younger. And we are going to talk with her about the inspirational power of music. And Brandy Younger is a leading voice of the harp today. She's a performer, composer, educator, and concert curator. She's performed and recorded with artists including Pharaoh Sanders, Ravi Coltrane, Jack DeJanette, Charlie Hayden, Common, John Legend, The Roots, Stevie Wonder, and Lauren Hill. In 2019, she released her fourth solo album, Soul Awakening, and her original composition, Hortense, was featured in the Netflix concert documentary, Beyonce Homecoming. This same year, she was selected to perform her original music as a featured performer for Quincy Jones and Steve McQueen's Soundtrack of America. She earned her Bachelor of Music in Heart Performance at the Heart School of Music and her Master of Music and Performing Arts Professions at New York University. She's taught at Adelphi University, Nass Nassau Community College, the Heart School, and at the University of Hartford. Residencies include and, and master classes include the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto, the University of Birmingham in the UK, Howard University, Drexel University, Princeton University, Tulane, Trinity College, the Hart School, University of Michigan, DePaul University, Berkeley College of Music, and she serves as symphonic and jazz harp artist in residence at the Cecily L. Tyson Community School of Performing and Fine Arts. She holds leadership positions uh, through the Apollo Theater Young Patron Steering Committee and the American Harp Society. As a concert curator, she organized Divine Ella, part of the Schoenberg Center for Research in Black Culture's annual Women's Jazz Festival. She also served as curator of the 2016 Harp on Park concert uh, and most recently coordinated her song featuring the works of women composers, both for Arts Brookfield. Please welcome the incredible Brandy Younger. Hi, David. Hello. I am so happy to spend time with you today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, um, you have quite the pedigree in the world of music. And my first question for you, Brandy, today is, you know, how can music play a part in our lives and how can music inspire us? I'm not sure that I was able to answer this question until this pandemic hit because what really kind of, uh, became apparent to me is, you know, essential workers versus non-essential workers. And, you know, I was like, I I'm a musician. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a nurse. I'm not making sure that people have food. So I really started to feel conflicted, you know, with, with what we do as musicians. And one of the things that I was doing once this pandemic hit in March, I started streaming every Friday from Facebook aimlessly but then I started to get all the messages the thank you so much this is really healing at a time when I'm sick or my family member is sick so I really started to realize the the, the not tangible power of music and I honestly I honestly didn't really see it so clearly until until now wow it took it took this um to reveal it <laughs> Is, is there, um, you know, your background is so impressive and you've had so many amazing experiences and collaborations. I'm curious, um, can you share with us what the moment was for you where you said, you know, there's nothing else I can do on this planet that will fulfill me the way that music can? 2007, um, I was out of college. Oh, see, now I'm dating myself. Ooh, 
let's say I was fresh out of college. Okay. <laughs> and although we I can do an edit after if you need. It. <laughs> it was just the other day. Um, yeah. I was fresh out of college, and you know, I I, I had a degree, and and I knew I didn't want to play orchestral music. Um, I didn't want to become an orchestral harpist, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. So it was at that time that one of my greatest idols, Alice Coltrane, passed away. And I played for her memorial at St. John the Divine Cathedral, which turned out to be a huge musical memorial with everyone she had played with and, and John Coltrane had played with. So for me, that was my turning point of, I know that this is going to be a hard road because it's not what I studied. I studied purely classical music. Um, it's going to be an uphill battle, but that was my, I call it my Oprah aha moment. So that 07. It was 07. Um, you know, you bring up a really Im interesting point, and that is sometimes in life, knowing what you don't want is actually more helpful than quote unquote what you want, because you, you, stay open to other possibilities. You're just closing yeah. one small door as opposed to a lot of them. Um, and you're keeping a lot of options open. So that is, that's incredible advice. Um, and, and what a great role model you are um, to share that. I'm curious. So, so music did it, this one moment, 2007 did it for you. Is there a particular piece of music or a note or a phrase that whenever you hear it, you say, yeah, that, that's it. That's what does it for me. You know, there is, there is. <laughs> Not to sound like a nerd, but I, I feel like my favorite chord is a sharp 11 chord, um, which I'll play for you, but Actually, what I wanted to play for you, I'd rather play this for you. So there's a harpist, and it's only about one minute long, don't worry. Uh, there's a harpist named Keziah Thomas. Um, just in sort of thinking about everything that's like hitting me during this pandemic. But she's over in the UK, and she wrote this piece for um, some workers at the hospital near her. And she posted a little clip on Instagram and I was like, oh my gosh, because I, I need that because what you just played is, is what I'm, it's what I'm feeling, you know? And yeah, I'm a composer, but she just wrote what I want, <laughs> what I wanted. So I would like to play a little snippet of that for you, if you wouldn't mind. Please do. Thank you. And she, she calls this uh, breathe. And I like anything in a minor key. If it sounds sad, I love it. Don't ask me why. <laughs> so here's just a little bit. It definitely has the quality of uh, being able to, uh, how do I say, tug at us a bit. Um, yeah. There's an, an emotional undercurrent to all of, to that beautiful piece. And then uh, the favorite chord I mentioned was the sharp 11 chord, which, I don't know, it's got a little scary quality to it. So is that what you, yeah, my next question was going to be like, what, what about what does that chord you know connect with for you? You said a little bit scary, like a little mystery, or well, there's a little tension, but it's not so much tension that it hurts the ear. 
got it. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so I'm also curious, what does Brandy Younger listen to when she's in her apartment or, you know, sheltered at home uh, when she's going through her day? Well, I might seem a little crazy, crazy, because it's not one genre of music. I'm either listening to, and I use Tidal, by the way. Everyone makes fun of me. They're like, you don't do Spotify? I use Tidal. I listen to J. Cole. I listen to Ravel. And then on Sundays, I listen to gospel. So yeah, I seem a little crazy, but uh, it works. And what, Brandy, if you were like, if you were to analyze, you know, those, those different types of music, what, what do you think they tap into in your personality? Uh, everything. So basically my whole musical upbringing was trying to connect what I was learning in my harp lessons with what I was listening to at home. So I may have been watching MTV and listening to Top 40, but I was studying French music or, or sometimes Baroque music. So, so for me, it was like, I have these two worlds, how can I combine them? And that was something I knew orchestra wasn't going to do for me. So that's how I got into kind of creating my own music and, and creating my own situations. So for me to be listening to J. Cole so much right now, but still listening to Ravel, and then gospel is just something I grew up listening to and singing in church. It, it's, it's natural. Do you, do you, when you hear a specific song or piece of music, do you have, you know, memories and connections with, with each one? Yeah. Absolutely. So there's a whole, there, beyond the soundtrack, there's a whole visual that's playing as well? Of course, and I, I don't, I mean, I can't speak for everyone, but I feel like everyone has that, you know, oh, when I was six, my mom used to always play this song, or I went to the circus and this was playing. You can always associate something in your life, the music that was playing during that time. That's sort of why I feel like Spike Lee's movies are so iconic. He really chooses the soundtracks very thoughtfully. Um, I don't watch TV. That's the pandemic has also introduced television to me. So we we can we can do another event and you can talk about television and you're <laughs> as a as a newbie watching it. <laughs> um, so besides some wonderful uh, compliments on your playing, one uh, one comment is if you would repeat the name of the song that you played earlier. Breathe by Keziah Thomas. Thank you. Um, and also we have from Julia, um, she asks if there are ways in which we can use music to express ourselves in an active way when we can't play an instrument. Yes, I think what a lot of people do, which I enjoy, curating playlists that speak to you. You, as a non-musician, can never, never even have to touch an instrument. You can create a playlist according to your mood. And there's so much music out there. I feel like there's something for everyone. So Brandy, if you, you know, with your incredible background and awards and, and everything, um, if you were to create a playlist to inspire all of us, what are what might be three pieces that would be on that list? Ah, five stair steps, ooh child. I think maybe thinking about Spike Lee made me think about that song. Um, the Makings of You by Curtis Mayfield, and Pavon for a Dead Princess by Ravel. I know again, they're very different. But well, this, you made me this is three, and it's not fair. Come on. This is what makes you so special. It really is, and 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 today this has been incredible getting to know more about you and and what inspires you. Um, thank you so much for for that. Um, 
one last question uh, before we go, and that is, um, what instrumentation would you wish for a composer to write for you? For me specifically, because um, I function mainly with a rhythm section these days with bass and drums, I would love um, something to be through composed for harp, bass, drums, and flute. Fantastic, lovely. Brandy, how can we follow you and learn more about what, where you're excellent, there you are. There I am, I'm Harpista on just about everything. I have a mailing list, which you can access through my, um, my Instagram. It's right there in my profile. And I've got a YouTube, the Facebook, I got everything. We can find you clearly. You're, you're, <laughs> you're not hiding. <laughs> um, Brandy, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your thoughts on music and how it can inspire us. And thank you so much for playing that beautiful piece and keep doing what you do and bringing music to all of our lives. Thank you, David. Thank you. Take care. You too. So we have another guest. So wouldn't it be wonderful to be able to go to a spa? Well, we can't quite do that right now, but we can do the next best thing. And that is create one at home. And the person that's gonna help us with that is Marie Rama. So Marie Rama is the creator of the popular blog and YouTube channel, Humble Bee and Me, where her thousands of readers and viewers learn how to create everything from body butters and balms to lipsticks and lotions. Her work has appeared on goodhousekeeping.com, womensday.com, and saja.ca. And she has spoken at events across Canada and the United States. Her first book, Make It Up, The Essential Guide to DIY Makeup and Skin Care, is all about creating your own cosmetics from scratch and was released by Running Press. Marie graduated summa cum laude from, with a Bachelor of Design Honors from York University and Sheridan College in Toronto, Canada, and holds a diploma in organic skin care formulation from Formula Botanica. She lives in Calgary, Canada. Please meet Marie Rama. Marie, hello. Hello, it's awesome to be here. Thanks so much for having me, David. Thank you for, for being with us. So, Marie, how do we build our own personal spa at home? Well, there are a lot of tips out there on the internet for creating kind of a DIY spa experience. And I am looking at kind of helping you level them up to you know, kind of dial back possibly the mess factor, make sure you're not doing anything that's gonna sort of make your skin like less relaxed <laughs> rather than, uh, than more relaxed. And look at a couple different ways where you, know, you could start really simple if you want. And then things that you could kind of use to level up if you're you know, really, really enjoying yourself because this is, a very, very fun hobby and can be a, a delightful sort of black hole for wonderful things to make if, if you uh, if you really find yourself sort of bitten by the uh, the DIY bug. <laughs> so I wanted to start by chatting just a quick little bit about the skin. Um, <laughs> so the skin is basically kind of like a squishy waterproof duffel bag that, you know, holds you together. So, you know, when you go grocery shopping, you don't like lose a kidney and, you know, you don't get a sunburn on your lungs. It's this great protective sack that, uh, you know, just does a really good job of, of, of keeping us together and protected from our environment. Uh, something that I really wanted to get in there like right from the get-go is that the skin doesn't absorb everything that it touches. It doesn't mean that you want to be putting anything and everything on your skin, of course, but that is kind of a, a myth I see a lot online, this idea that like, you know, everything you put on your skin ends up in your bloodstream within like seven seconds or uh, that sort of thing. And, and thankfully that's not true because I mean, if it was, can you imagine you, know, you, you go swimming and now uh, you bloat to double your size and you have to you know, go to the bathroom <laughs> for, for next four hours because you would have absorbed all the all the pool water so thankfully that's uh, that's not true and kind of one of the other ones that I just wanted to get out right from the beginning is just because you eat something and it's good uh, good nutritionally wise doesn't necessarily mean it's good for the skin so that's going to be another thing we're going to be looking at using some more sort of professional uh, and appropriate ingredients choosing ingredients because they're good for your skin not just because you already have them 
So if we are to uh, DIY our own spa products, um, where do we start? I honestly think one of the best places that you can start is with a clay face mask. So you will need to have some clay, but it's very readily available on websites like Amazon. And so I wanted to introduce you to sort of three of my uh, top choices of clay. I'd say French green clay, which is this, this sort of unassuming pale green powder, is my favorite clay. I find that it's quite gentle, but not so gentle that you kind of feel like it doesn't do anything. Uh, I love to uh, kind of moisten this. And we'll talk about different things you can moisten with in a moment. Put it on my face, let it get up maybe like 50% dry and then wash that off with a damp cloth. And it has wonderful, gentle physical exfoliation and really helps stimulate circulation. So I really find that I notice a, a boost in healing in coming days after doing a clay face mask. It'll kind of help give things a little bit of a, a kick in the backside if maybe you've got a blemish or a bug bite or something that uh, you know, could use a little bit of uh, assistance moving along. If you have skin that's more on the sensitive side, I really like white kaolin clay. So again, just a fairly unassuming white powder. And these are all really very inexpensive. Uh, and then one that's very popular as well, and I would recommend this for uh, oilier skin types, is bentonite clay. So bentonite clay is very, very absorbent, especially compared to these other two. I've got a video on my YouTube channel comparing the white kaolin and the bentonite. And you can see the absorbency difference is insane. Um, something to note about bentonite clay, it is, it is quite basic. So when you hydrate it, I recommend hydrating it with something slightly acidic. So one of my favorite hydration choices for something like this would be maybe some plain uh, full fat Greek yogurt that's been thinned in a bit of water because that will be acidic or some uh, diluted lemon juice. Definitely not pure lemon juice. That's, that's a bit too much of a swing in the opposite direction, but a bit of diluted lemon juice. And then that can make for a beautiful brightening facial mask. So if you've got some pigmentation that's kind of fading away from, again, perhaps a past blemish or something that can really help noticeably brighten that away in a few uses, which is great because it's inexpensive and super easy to do at home. Um, talking about things that we can moisten with, some other options. I love hydrosol. So this here is a rose hydrosol, but you can get tons of different types of hydrosols, a cucumber or strawberry, blood orange, lavender. If you do decide to go with something like peppermint, I recommend cutting the peppermint hydrosol with more just plain water because the, the mintiness of it can really make your eyes run and your nose run and you'll sort of have a face mask on and just be like dripping and it's, it's, it's not great. It's you not, want to not do really what you want. Yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> So yeah, that would be honestly one of the top, top things I'd recommend. Clay face masks can feel very, uh, very much like the sort of thing that we don't do at home. A lot of face mask recipes you'll find online are sort of, you know, like mash up an avocado and put that on your face. Um, and that can absolutely be really nice as well. If you've got very dry skin, uh, all the fats in the avocado can be really, really lovely. Um, but if you're looking to sort of maybe clear out some pores, stimulate some circulation, get a little bit of gentle physical exfoliation in there. Uh, some clay is a really easy way to go about it. And you can get big tubs and bags of clay in the 10 to $15 range. And the shelf life is indefinite. So you don't have to worry about it spoiling on you, which is really nice. Um, Amazon's an easy place to get those. Or if you visit my website, humblebeeandme.com, in the top menu, there's a link that says where to buy ingredients. And if you click on there, I've got tons of places to shop all over the world and you'll find, <laughs> you'll find those clays listed or places to buy those clays listed there. So if I'm if I create one of these masks with one of these clays, how long uh, do I keep it on, and how much hydration do I need? So usually, what I like to do is start with about one teaspoon of clay, um, and you, so you'll have your kind of your bowl of liquid. You'll probably start with about a tablespoon of liquid, but again, this is going to vary a lot with the clay that you're using because some are a lot more absorbent than others. Um, but I would start with about a tablespoon of, of liquid and you wanna make sure the pH is, is not crazy. Uh, you don't need a pH meter or pH strips or this sort of thing, but just make sure it's not like pure lemon juice or pure vinegar because that, that will be too much for your skin. Start with about a tablespoon of liquid and you'll have it in a little bowl, like something like this. And then you're just gonna slowly sprinkle in the clay, whisk it together. And when you have a nice creamy spreadable paste, you're done. You're gonna wanna spread that on the face 
you probably leave that for about 15 minutes before you start to wash it off. Honestly, the easiest way to wash them off is in the shower. Uh, you can definitely make <laughs> a pretty good mess with these clays, especially as they dry and then can kind of start to crumble off. So you'll wanna, like you can definitely do it, with just hold a damp cloth to the face just for you know 30 seconds and let the moisture from the cloth soften the mask a bit and then it's easier to wipe off, but it's much easier to just get in the shower and uh, get it all off in there. Excellent. What are some other things we can do to bring the spa to our home? So the other big category for like easy, lovely, relaxing spa things you can do at home is things to do uh, in your tub, basically bath things. And there are a lot of really Pinteresty style kind of hacks out there for things that you can do in your bath. So I just kind of wanted to help level some of them up. So one of the biggest ones that we hear is, and it looks gorgeous in the pictures, is putting botanicals, so things like, you know, dried or fresh rose petals or calendula petals or lavender buds in your tub. And that's lovely until you are done your bath and then you have to clean it up <laughs> and you have a bunch of like wet, soggy botanicals kind of coating the edge of your tub and you're like, wow, I felt so relaxed. And now I have to like put on the rubber gloves and go scrub my bathtub. <laughs> so a good workaround for that uh, is using some kind of a tea style sachet. So I have two here. This one is a disposable one. You can see it's reasonably large and you can get them even bigger than this. Um, and you would fill it up in the opening here, and then you can seal it with, uh, with a, a flat iron if you have one or a normal iron because these are heat sealed. And then that way when you're done your bath, you have a lovely soak and then you just pull this out like a tea bag and pop it in your compost bin, no worries. Uh, the other option that's a bit more zero waste would be a drawstring muslin bag. And so after you were done your bath, you would pull this out, you'd empty the contents out into your compost, and then you could let this dry, uh, remove anything that kind of is still stuck in there, and then you can give it a wash and you can reuse that. So that's one great way to have a nice herbal bath without uh, having to do a bunch of chores <laughs> afterwards when you're feeling all zen. Um, and then scrubs. Scrubs are another really fun one that uh, can, I think, be greatly improved by making sure that they're not too messy. Um, so one of the first things you want to look at when you're choosing scrub ingredients is uh, what is the scrub? And is this going to leave just a uh, like a beach of residue in your tub. So one that's really popular is using coffee grounds, but coffee grounds aren't water soluble. And so you kind of end up with this, like a, a pile of coffee grounds at the bottom of your bathtub that you kind of need to scoop out, or you might be worried about them going down your drain and then clogging your drain. And nobody likes a self-care session that ends with an emergency call to a plumber. Uh, that's just, that's no fun. <laughs> so I recommend sticking with things that you already have at home that are inexpensive and water soluble. So one of my favorites is sugar, just white granulated sugar is a great exfoliant. It, uh, it will dissolve in the water. So obviously, uh, you know, it's first contact with water is going to be on your damp skin and it'll slowly start to dissolve as you massage it into damp skin and then it'll dissolve in the water and it'll go down the drain and you're not picking <laughs> coffee grounds out of, um, out of your bath for ages. You can also use salt, table salt, or you can use a fancy salt, so something like some Himalayan pink salt I have here. Um, the larger the grain, the longer it will take to dissolve. So this lovely large grain Himalayan salt wouldn't be a great choice because it feels like you're sitting on gravel on the bottom of your tub after you're done with it. You just kind of have this thing sticking into your bum. Not my favorite. Uh, so you want to use a finer grain salt. A thing to keep in mind about salt is that if you uh, Ha tend to maybe nick yourself while shaving or you just went for a trail run and you've been bashed up by some twigs or something on the side of the path, salt can really sting in, uh, in open wounds. <laughs> so I tend to chew sugar more than salt for that uh, reason alone. And so I see Catherine over, asking- Go sweet over salty. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I just, I see Catherine asking a very um, 
topical question about baking soda. I generally don't recommend using baking soda as a scrub because baking soda is very basic. So the CN has a pH of about four and a half. Baking soda has a pH of about nine. It is substantially more basic than the skin and can be very damaging to the acid mantle, which is the protective uh, layer that sits on top, on top of uh, the, the epidermis. And so, yeah, I definitely recommend sticking with something that has a pH much closer to neutral or even slightly acidic rather than choosing something very basic, which can really harm the, uh, harm the stratum corneum and the, the acid mantle. Marie, you touched upon earlier, um, just because something is good to eat, you don't necessarily put it on your face. Would you give us a couple of examples of the don't do this, uh, the avoids? Yeah, well, so, um... One of the easiest ones to kind of look towards is the world of things like spices. Uh, you'll want to be very careful to the point of just like outright avoidance of anything that's quite hot. So, I mean, please don't put ground cayenne pepper in a scrub and then climb into the bathtub with that. That would be very uncomfortable. But the same can be true of cinnamon. Cinnamon really stimulates circulation and can really cause quite a warm to uncomfortable uh, flushing sensation on, on the skin. And so sometimes you see suggestions for using it as like an exfoliant on the face. Uh, and that's not a great idea because it can be uh, very, very irritating. Uh, baking soda is another example of something that's generally far too harsh for the skin. It can have it, its place, for instance, in bath bombs. In bath bombs, it's combined with citric acid. So they react in your tub and, and they neutralize each other. Uh, but things like baking soda deodorants, people typically find them to be really quite irritating, especially over uh, overextended use. And then things that are really, really acidic, things like lemon juice and vinegar, if you are going to be using those in your skincare, make sure they are very, very well diluted because things that are too acidic are also not good um, for your acid mantle. And um, would you walk us through, um, you, you, know, you, just, you just spoke about the ingredients of creating a scrub. Um, walk us through how, what is the proper way to create that scrub, use it, and then store it? So the, uh, the easiest way to make a scrub, like your, this would be like DIY day one, my recommendation would be to combine basically equal parts, uh, white sugar, and an inexpensive carrier oil. So I've got some sweet almond oil here. You could also use, um, some fractionated coconut oil, also sometimes sold as MCT. It's the liquid one, not the solid one. Don't use anything that might solidify down your pipes after it cools down. So nothing like coconut oil uh, or butter, I guess, kind of comes to mind. Butter, don't, but ew, <laughs> dairy butter. It'd be a very peculiar scrub. Um, yeah, you want to make sure that it's going to stay liquid down your, uh, as it goes down your drains. Even something like canola oil or sunflower oil, safflower oil, it's something that you kind of already have. Definitely not your finest extra virgin olive oil. That would be quite sad. Um, but the big thing that I want to suggest as a way to level this up is to include some sort of an emulsifier. So emulsifiers help oil and water mix. And so if we just have oil and sugar, that oil, it's going to feel really lovely on the skin. But when you go to get out of your bath at the end, it's not going to rinse down the drain completely. Your tub's going to be really slippery. So not only do you need to clean your tub, especially if you also shower in your tub, you need to be really careful when you get out so you don't like slip and fall and hurt yourself. Uh, so where do you find emulsifiers? Now they are ingredients that you can just buy if that's, uh, if that's a thing you wanna do, if you feel like you'd like to own a jug of polysorbate 80, knock yourself out, that'll do the trick. But a few kind of quicker, easier things that you might already have at home. If you have an inexpensive lotion at home, something like a, you know, a drugstore lotion that comes in one of those like 750 mil pump top bottles. If you dispense maybe like three tablespoons of that and blend that with some sugar, you need to use it immediately, like use it straight away, take that right into the bath with you, use it all up. But because it has a small amount of emulsifier in there, which is what's holding the lotion together because it contains both oil and water, that'll rinse down your, your drain way better than just pure oil. But definitely make sure it's an inexpensive lotion. Don't go out and uh, you know use like your La Mer or your like Chanel face lotion for this sort of thing, just something, something inexpensive that you already have in your house is a great way to get a little bit of uh, 
a little bit of an emulsifier in there without having to go by a, a specialty ingredient. And then once you have that, yeah, when you're soaking in your tub, feeling the need to give yourself a little bit of a buffing, I just like to use my hands. So scoop it out, make sure whatever you're taking your scrub into the bath with it isn't going to break. So no glass. I also don't recommend metal just because the number of times I've nearly had a heart attack dropping a small metal bowl in my shower. It is so loud. <laughs> Somebody in your house might think that you've just died. Uh, so just plastic, just a bit of lightweight plastic little leftover container usually works real well. Take that into the bath, massage it into your skin, pay extra special attention to more rough areas. So like knee caps and elbows. Uh, and then yeah, rinse off. You might need to use the shower extension if you have one that can also be helpful for rinsing down the sides of the tub. And then that's pretty much it. I do recommend making sure that everything that you're making is either getting used up uh, very, very quickly. So immediate use, or if it doesn't contain any water, if you're uh, if you made a big batch in your kitchen and you took some into the tub with you and you have some left over and this is this would just be the sugar and water or sorry the sugar and oil version no water that you can cover and keep in the fridge for a week or two and that should be totally fine it's just when things start to get water in them that spoilage starts to be a concern so after we've had our fabulous diy spa day um and we've done our scrub and we've done our mask um, and we've had a phenomenally relaxing bath. Um, it, what do you recommend in terms of maybe moisturizing the skin after that, after that day of beauty? Yeah, so you're already going to have really well hydrated skin. So it, there's gonna be a lot of water in the skin from having sat in the tub. So what we kind of want to do is just slow the evaporation of that. And one of the best ways to do that is just with an oil or a butter that you adore. So I've got a couple different options here that I'm a big fan of. One of my favorites is cocoa butter. So this here is a lump of beautiful, pure, unrefined cocoa butter. I want to eat it, David. It smells so good. <laughs> But cocoa butter melts right around body temperature. So as you hold it on the skin, it will just slowly melt and slowly dispense just a small amount of oil on the skin, which you can then rub in. It's not very oily or greasy and you will smell like chocolate. You can also do that with pure coconut oil. If coconut oil agrees with your skin, I know that's very popular and something a lot of people will have at home. If you suffer from something like eczema, shea butter can be very useful. I'm certainly not going to claim that this is like a medical medical advice for that sort of thing, but it's a wonderful, rich, occlusive. And I have heard from many people that anecdotally shea butter has been very useful for extra dry skin. And then if you, uh, if you really are quite averse to things that are oily, you can choose really lightweight liquid carrier oils. So this one is, is passion fruit oil, which is really lovely. Um, you can also use things like rosehip oil or camellia seed oil. That's the same oil that we get tea leaves from. And it's been used in Japan for beauty pur purposes for centuries and centuries. It's gorgeous and it absorbs into the skin very, very quickly, just leaving this lightweight, almost dry satiny feel on the skin. So you'll have the water from the bath and the soak and the scrub, and then you'll just kind of help lock it in with a beautiful lightweight oil. Wonderful. Well, you are giving us no excuse to uh, relax and, uh, and treat ourselves well. Um, so thank you for that. Marie, how can we find out more about you and what you do? Ah, there it is. So we have your book and we can follow you um, and your website. Um, Marie, in closing, uh, what is something that you feel is the biggest misconception about DIY and you can change that with, your, with what you're about to say? I think among people who have tried maybe just a few little things, they might have had a bad first experience because sometimes, yeah, you, you make the scrub and you end up with the slippery tub or the tub full of coffee grounds. So I really want people to know that you can make amazing high-end products at home if you want to. Uh, 
I made like my eyeliner today and my eyeshadow and my lip color and my foundation. I make most of my skincare products using high performing ingredients like ceramides and niacinamide and panthenol and hyaluronic acid. So if you do want to do these things at home, you absolutely can. If you want to keep it simple, you can do that too, but you can still make it great. It doesn't have to feel like a compromise to make things yourself. It can be it's like baking, except, you know, you take it into the bath with you instead of uh, you know, having to give it away to all your friends and families so that it doesn't go to <laughs> Wait, no, I do that. I do that too. All my friends baking and family are one in a bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> Marie, thank you so much. You have given us uh, so much fantastic info. Um, and I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, I also want to thank uh, the incredible Brandy Younger and Esther Blum. Uh, so my name is David Zyla and you can follow me um, and uh, see more of these wonderful uh, shows on my YouTube channel. Um, thank you for joining us and we'll see you next time.